Good evening, everyone. My name is Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo College. And in partnership with the New York Film Academy, our good friends that we partner with often, welcome to Conversations on Essential Cinema. Tonight's film, The Great Dictator, the 1940 political satire classic of black humor and politics by the legendary Charlie Chaplin. He wrote the film, he directed the film, he produced the film, he starred in the film, he even co-wrote the music for the film. And so there's an incredible history to this. And it's also after our most recent political election, there's much to discuss about 1930s Germany. People always make that association. And we have a very, very special guest to discuss the film with you tonight. A legend in his own right, truly. Uh, Alan Zweibel, one of America's truly most gifted humorists. And in so many ways, his uh, humor writings uh, and sketches have sort of influenced uh, political and, and entertainment culture really since the 1970s. Um, and in some cases, even before, he was among the original writers for Saturday Night Live. He was the co-creator of the Gary Shandling Show. Uh, he executive produced uh, Love Gilda, an award-winning documentary about Gilda Radner. He uh, co-wrote the Broadway smash hit 700 Sundays with Billy Crystal. Uh, he's written 10 books. He's written uh, uh, various humor pieces for The New Yorker. He, uh, let me think, oh, he's got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Writers Guild of America. I mean, this guy is really the perfect person to discuss uh, The Great Dictator. And, and get ready for this. He has a new book out. It's a memoir, ready for this title, Laugh Lines, My Life Helping Funny People Be Funnier, <laughs> which is a great title. And you, well, we're gonna talk about that book hopefully by the end of the evening. And we're gonna show you some links uh, soon about how to get the book. If you're watching us live on Facebook, welcome. We always love that. Please like us on Facebook and come to folks.org and sign up for our email list for future programs. If you have a question for Alan, uh, you can go to the Q&A box and leave it there. And the chat box for the rest of the evening will have more information about the new book, Laugh Lines, and links on how to get it. Alan, welcome. Thanks so much, my friend, for joining us. Thanks for having me, Thane. This is a real pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, well, I was really excited about this, Alan. You know, we've done this new series has been super popular. People from all over the world have been watching it. We had Sharon Stone with Casablanca. We had Matthew Modine for the uh, 12 Angry Men. And, you know, this, we, it's just so much fun to do this, to look Great. at an absolute classic film that people either haven't seen uh, or haven't seen in a long time and to actually have the kind of folk style conversation that we, we enjoy doing. So let me start with an anecdote. It's actually an anecdote that involves me. Uh, and it goes like <laughs> this. I won't be saying anything else. It just involves me. Uh, when the, uh, the musical, the producers came to Broadway, the Los Angeles Times called me and asked me to do a long form essay for the culture section, which I did. I'm not gonna tell you what I wrote. But that essay, a few months later, wound up getting me on the news hour with Jim Lair. Why? Because Jim Lair watched the Tony Awards that year. And you may remember, Alan, uh, no, no musical has ever, I think even with Hamilton, received this number record of both nominations and wins. And by the end of the night, Mel Brooks had gone back and forth so many times that at the last time, this is what Jim Lehrer watched. And that's why he told his producer, find me some guy to talk about this tomorrow. Mel Brooks got up there and he said, you know, thank you all so much. But the truth is I thanked everyone I could possibly thank. I guess what I should really do now is thank Adolf Hitler. Because if it wasn't for Adolf Hitler, I would have never conceived of the movie, the original version of the movie, or for that matter, the, the musical. And of course, the next day, uh, 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 Jim Lehrer saw that he was very disturbed by it. He thought it was a very strange thing and he wanted to talk about it. So I want to talk about it. Let's start sure. with this. Is there anything that's off limits? Should, can Hitler be funny? Um, Charlie Chaplin himself said that, he said, I haven't wrote this down. He said the, that the film was inadequate to the gravity of the events depicted. He was even saying later on when he realized what was really happening, 
that it really does not depict what I, it, it should have been depicting, even as a comedy. And then he said, after years later, after he realized about the Holocaust, he said, you know what, if I'd known that, I wouldn't have made it. So think about that, Alan. We wouldn't have even had it if, the, if Daryl Chaplin is telling us the truth. So you've been doing this for so much of your career. In a moment, we'll talk about Saturday Night Live and the way, in some ways, you invented it for television here in the United States. Do you have a, a strong view, one way or the other, that art and atrocity and comedy never mix, period? Or everything is up for grabs. And if it is, it could, if I decided tomorrow to call you and say, Alan, we're good friends, can we co-write a musical about Osama bin Laden? What do you think with that? I don't know whether you would agree. Is that one of those things that's simply too soon? It, it may be a tad soon, but you know something in general, you know, there's a um, this wonderful documentary out there called The Last Laugh. You're it's in it. Humor and the Holocaust. And you're and, in it. Yeah, I'm, I'm in it. And there are a lot of people giving testimony as to how far you can go humor wise. And Mel said in it, um, he said when he did the producers, he went, yeah, he did Hitler, but he didn't do the camps. He didn't do, um, you know, the horrors. He didn't do Auschwitz. Okay. And the fact of the matter is, if you watch that film, there's a woman in it who is actually the spine of the movie. Her, she's a 92 or 93-year-old Auschwitz survivor. And she lives here in the United States. And you follow her life. And she says, you needed a sense of humor to survive the Holocaust. She showed, they show footage of Jews you know, in the pajama um, uniforms that they wore, uh, the, the, uh, putting on shows for the SS. And she said you needed to survive it. And it gave license to a little bit more, okay, maybe we can laugh about it. Look, it's such an atrocity. But when this woman says at the end, you know, if Hitler saw my life today, I would have the last laugh. Hence the title of the documentary. I think that everything is up to up for grabs. There's an asterisk there, though. You know, there has to be a sensitivity. You can't make fun of it, but you can acknowledge it happened and then have your humor go accordingly. So let okay? me ask you something, because you raised this based on what you heard with Mel. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about other Holocaust films. We could we could spend a few minutes talking about it. Are you saying that Mel Brooks would never have made Life is Beautiful because that movie was in the camps? But by the way, I wrote passionately against that film when it came out precisely for that point. Or, you know, Jerry Lewis very famously made a film that I, I don't know if you know this anecdote. It's called The, the, Cra the Day the Clown Cried or Died yeah. or Lied. I can know, cried. And apparently this movie is in a vault somewhere, Alan. Do you know the story about this? It is in a vault. It's, it's considered like one of the most, like one of the worst films ever made. And it was never released, although Jerry Lewis ended up at the end of saying, look, I still think we should watch this movie in which he plays a clown in Auschwitz. You know something, um, life is beautiful. And the day the uh, clown cried or died or whatever he did. Um, what Mel Brooks did okay, was look at the context that he did. He had two producers, Bialystok and Bloom, wanted to make a failed show so they can oversell and make money on it. What's the worst thing to make fun of? I oh, see. springtime for Hitler. It was in the context of putting on a bad show, which miraculously everybody <laughs> laughed at, okay? That's a little different than going inside the camps. You know, uh, an argument that I remember years ago when I was, I was much younger, maybe it was in college, when they were talking about, well, um, Stalag 17. Okay, what, what was the TV show that um, was like a, a comedy version of it? Oh, my God. St uh, Hogan's Heroes. Oh, no, no. Oh. Was it hope? It was to go inside and not be real is different 
is different than say, let's put on the worst show that we can. I don't know if Mel would have done Life is Beautiful because then you would be inside. You would be in it. And if for it to have any verite, you would have to show the horrors of it. Whereas they only sang a song and Kenny yeah. Mars was on a roof with pigeons, you know? It's a good, it's an interesting distinction. And that's very helpful to hear. And I hope the audience will process that in a way for themselves. It's, it's a big idea, it is. It's a question, you know, the German, philosopher Theodore Adorno famously wrote uh, no poetry after Auschwitz and people interpreted that sentence no poetry out of Auschwitz is that you should never make art out of atrocity period you can do documentaries you can do journalism you can write memoirs because if you were there it's your story man tell your story but art doesn't mix with and this is this has been an ongoing debate you know, in this community, right? For instance, there were people that were critical of Sophie's choice because she was in the camp, right? They were critical of Sophie's choice because she wasn't even Jewish. It bothered people to say, well, it didn't even represent what mostly the most of the victims weren't Polish Catholics, they were Jews. So there was criticism about that. You know, these issues about making films, art about the Holocaust have been loaded. Even Schindler's List received, you know, Elie Wiesel was opposed to every single one. There wasn't one that he thought was worth keeping. And especially, remember that television show from the 70s, The Holocaust, yeah. right, that introduced like Meryl Streep and James Woods to him. He, he, he wrote for the New York Times Magazine completely saying, this is sacrilege, it's, it's transgressive. This is, not what it, this is not what I went through. Yeah, and okay, so That's, there's a big issue what you just said, the word, this is not what I went through, okay? I can make an argument, not that I necessarily believe it's because I have to process it, but I can make an argument that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the only way that we'll be able to remember and leave a paper trail and show our children and grandchildren that this existed, that this indeed happened, is by making art out of this. Okay, so I, I, I'm not going to, you know, Elie Wiesel, you know. I, I understand. All the cards. I'm not going to argue with that, man. Look mm -hmm. what he went through in his life. Look what any, ever, any of the survivors went through. So I can understand that. But there does become a time where we go, we owe it through art to pass on the memory of this and the representation of it, not exploiting it, mind you, but at the same time, if... It could be a reminder or it could even be an education to younger people and generations to come. Well, it's important to hear. I, it's important for us to hear it from you. Let me tell you why. Uh, you've won five Emmy Awards, but you're a Jewish male of a certain generation. You're not insensitive to this issue, right? This is this I suspect in your is part of who you are. You know, you grew up in New York, I think, and up, you know, in, in the Northeast. This is hardly unfamiliar terrain. At the same time, you know, you're an artist. <laughs> so, you know, this is something that you understand how to speak the language of art. It's, it's a fascinating thing. Yeah, I grew up on Long Island. Um, my grandparents who were alive and well, but came from Europe. And um, you look, you're talking to a guy whose mother would have disowned him had I married out of the faith. Okay, wow. so the influence of the shtetl, of everything that we uh, ran from, Kristallnacht, the whole thing was still fresh in the, in the family's culture, if you will. Yeah. I have grandchildren now. I turned 70 somehow last May. <laughs> I don't know how the hell that You are happened. an extremely but, youthful looking 70, my friend. Well, thank you. The, <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is, I now consider it my duty as a parent, as a grandparent, to make sure that they know that this happened, this meaning the Holocaust. Atrocities have happened. It's important. Uh, that all being said, I can't expect them to have the same feelings and passion about it that I may have because I heard it firsthand. So, but once again, I think that you know, what, what art is, is an expression of anything that you're feeling at a moment. And it's the execution of it. I don't think necessarily the subject itself is off limits. How do you tell it? 
Okay. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to land there, Thame. Okay, okay, good. No, it's good. I think you were very convincing. So let's just talk about some things that I think are important for the context of this film. Sure. You made me think of it when you said, hey, look, you know, <laughs> there was a, a, a shtetl ghetto mentality in my house in Long Island. So like, I understand this world, even though I wasn't born there. And so let's just think about this for a moment. The studio heads in the 1940s who left from Queens and, 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 and deep camped for Hollywood and built those gigantic studios. Many of them were first generation Jews. Some of them weren't even born in the United States. They are literally from the shtetl. Now think about that, right? Throughout the entire 1930s, Germany had an ambassador essentially in Hollywood whose job it was to tell the studio heads, Jewish studio heads, that make sure you don't make any movies critical of Hitler or the Third Reich. Why did they care? Well, I don't know if you know this, Alan, Germany had at, at that time was by far the second leading market for the distribution of Hollywood films beyond anything else in Europe. And these studio heads had a sense that their families were, they knew their families were being persecuted. At the time, they may not have realized that there was gas chambers, but it was still, they knew what Hitler meant. And yet they took orders from Hitler's ambassador. It's just fascinating anecdote, right? I don't know if you have any response to this. I mean, this is the, the thing is that until the great dictator, Alan, no one saw in film depictions of Nazis other than Laney Riefenstahl's 35 documentary, which was, you know, a, a, a celebration, a Valentine to Hitler, a triumph of the will. But you didn't see Jews in movies and you didn't see Nazis in movies. You saw cowboys and Indians and you saw Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. I think people need to understand what, how shocking this was. And it took a guy with Chaplin's clout to pull this off. Well, you know something, I read a book years ago, um, An Empire of Their Own by Neil Gabler. Neil Gabler, yeah. yeah. Neil Gabler, which was talking exactly about what you're talking about. So I've given this thought. I've given this a lot of thought. And when I watched the movie again the other night in anticipation of this evening, what dawned on me was prior to The Great Dictator, I guess it was about six, seven years earlier, the Marx Brothers, Jewish people, mm -hmm. did duck soup. Yeah. Okay. So in order to do, which was more standard fare, look, it was a, a musical, it was funny, it was silly, it was Fredonia against Sylvania. And what it was, was a parody of war, it, 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 of a situation. I, I wonder if you're uh, familiar with Roy Blunt Jr.'s book, Hail, Hail, Euphoria, yeah. because mm -hmm. it's about the making of duck soup where it's, they put it in a historical, he put it in a historical context, and what did the Marx Brothers mean? Meanwhile, one time I, I saw Macho, uh, Gracho Marx being interviewed, and he said, we, we were just trying to be funny, okay? <laughs> but, okay, uh, but there you had- So you're uh, saying, wait, you're saying that in some ways, Alan, you're saying duck soup to you might have even been a precursor to the great dictator, that it's a step along the chain? I think thing? it's a step along the way. Now, what happens is there you had two fictitious countries and one of them was uh, bankrupt and then they got into a war with each other because Groucho called the, uh, the king of the other country an upstart and he got slapped and, and a war began, okay? There was Margaret Dumont and all of that. However, I do believe that sometimes things don't take real big leaps they take little steps along the way. Now, but if Duck Soup, this fictitious, wonderful Marx Brothers musical about war was a step along the way, I am with you 100% with, it's a giant leap yeah. still to get yeah. to the great dictator. You know, it's interesting. When I was watching the movie the other night, I wrote down, things that I had never seen in a movie before. He talked about Jews. They, you mentioned ghettos, concentration camps. Says a quote was poison gas will kill everybody. Another quote was kill all the Jews and then the brunettes. <laughs> Leaving only blonde, a blonde Aryan race. 
But no, no, but then, but then the, remember what garbage says. He finishes up the the line, Alan. This is the I I, can't, I, I love this that I'm actually coaching Alan's Y Bell through the joke, Please. right? No, no, this is great, Alan. I love this moment. The joke ends when garbage says everything you said. Remember, garbage is playing Goebbels, the propaganda Go minister, and then he says he throws in the line, the throwaway line. And this country of only blue eye, blue eyed and blonde haired people would be led by a brunette. <laughs> that will be led by a brunette. It's hilarious. <laughs> but, you know, something lines like that, you know, also there was Hebrew writing. Yes. In the background on stores. You know what I mean? I don't know if it said kosher. I don't know what it was because it went by. But I saw actual Hebrew writing and I'm saying to myself, OK, then you remember that a lot of this predated what indeed happened. The camps right. hadn't happened yet and whatever. The, the, the balls that it took for this reality to deal within the reality of it. So whereas the Marx Brothers was a total farce. You know, look, um, you've had these kinds of movies, but not like this. And even I would venture to say, I'm trying to think about movies that we've had since that have yeah. had this kind of reality well also well, here here's one reality alan which is the the that there were avowedly jewish characters playing jews yes. right not what we remember from the 30s like where there were jewish actors like kirk douglas you know who were in play this was jews that were playing ghetto jews right they had faces mannerisms that had never been, other than the jazz singer, this would have been the only other film in that era that would have shown Jews the way you would represent them in a shtetl. Absolutely. I, I, I watched them. I, I, I looked really closely and I compared it to, you know, some of the Isaac Bashevis singer um, short yeah. stories and books. And Good point. You know, as far back as Shalom Aleichem. Good point. I, I, I can go, wait a second, there is a reality here. And I think that that's what made it resonate and still resonate even today. But, but I think that Chaplin was, his brilliance showed because even within the severity of what he was talking about, he was still Chaplin. Right. Okay? Whether he was Adenoid Hinkle or if he was the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the barber, he, he was still Chaplin. And I think that that's what made it um, Brilliantly entertaining. Is that a good so one? Let, before I get to this next question, let me just run back to the audience and you might enjoy just a quick timeline. Very quick. Sure. So 1935 is Triumph of the Will, a movie that celebrates Hitler in a documentary and shows him as a spellbinding speaker uh, and uh, millions of fans, right, all throughout the pageantry of the master race. 1936 is Jesse Owens in the Berlin Olympics. Uh, 1938 is Kristallnacht, right? 1941, um, uh, oh, 1940 is The Great Dictator, right? So in some ways, in many ways, Chaplin is really talking about Kristallnacht, because although he mentions the camps, he doesn't know that there's gas chambers yet, because we're actually not there. 1941 is Pearl Harbor. 1942 is the Wannsee Conference, where the Nazis decided what to do with the Jews. That was the conference in 1942, January, in which they decided we'll gas them and we'll, we'll bury them in killing fields. That was 19. Three months later, Alan, they start the process in Auschwitz. So January is the conference. March, they start gassing in 1942. Chaplin is over two years. The movie came out in March of 1940, literally two years before the gas chambers, right? It's extraordinary. In 43, at that point, Auschwitz now has four gas chambers, four crematoria. It's moving at full pace. And then, of course, in 1942, interestingly, another farce comes out that no one really wanted, saw, which was To Be or Not to Be. That film, right, the Jack Benny film. Jack Benny movie, yes. Which sure. also, Alan, was another mistaken identity Hitler movie, right? Similar set setup. So that, I just wanted the audience to hear that run up again to show you the extraordinary timing of how critical this was and how shocking it must have been that he was able to do this. Um, let's talk a little about SNL, I'll tell you why. 
because I credit you of introducing Americans to mainstream political satire. It didn't really exist in a mainstream way until you and your buddies at SNL in 1975. We never saw, you know, certainly not on television and not in films. Uh, we didn't have what we, you ended up, you know, you wrote for Chevy Chase when he was Gerald Ford. You wrote for Dan Aykroyd when he played Jimmy Carter, right? I mean, you introduced today, we take it for granted. Someone on the SL has to do the president, right? But that never happened before, right? We didn't do this with Nixon. We didn't have a show at the time like that. So one question is, when you were at SNL, at some point, the writers must have said, you know what, well, we should do political satire. You know, what, what we should really go after the president and go at just talk about what's happening in the political culture. How did that happen? And you, clearly, you were at the very center of those discussions. Well, it was Lorne Michaels. And uh, Lorne insisted from day one that there was an audience out there of baby boomers who were not being spoken to comedically on television, especially variety television. And you talk about timelines, put it into context where um, a year before Nixon resigned because of Watergate. Now you had this new guy, you know, in a you know, predated a few years before there was uh, Woodstock. So there was a social revolution going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what happened was there was the confluence of, um, now there was this guy Ford, okay, who fell down a lot. It, <laughs> it, was, Lorne, it was Lorne's vision that because we were live, we would do weekend update and do the news of the week. And you're right. Now that I think about it, <clears throat> what predated SNL, yeah, you had Vaughn Mita doing the, uh, the first family album. Where that was the, a record. It was a comedy record. And David Steinberg and David Fry and, and, and Rich Little, when he would go on The Tonight Show, he would sound like a Richard Nixon, but you applauded the approximation. But of you were Vaughan. doing sketches. It's very That's different. Absolutely right. Very different. You're not just doing a impersonation. In fact, I would argue that you didn't care about the impersonation. Oh, no. because Dan Aykroyd did Jimmy Dan Carter. Dan, when Danny Aykroyd did Jimmy Carter, Danny had a mustache, something Jimmy Carter never had. <laughs> but, okay, he never had a mustache. He may have one now, but he's 90s. Yeah, I don't know if he grows so much. But the fact of the matter is, it didn't matter because there was an essence being captured there. A lot of the political pieces when we first started were written by Al Franken and Tom Davis. Uh, they did the final days uh, you know, of, of Richard Nixon. They did the Wood, Woodward and Bernstein stuff. And you know something? There was a writer on the show who came from Harvard, joined us, uh, I think, the second year and remained there for many, many years, uh, named Jim Downey. <clears throat> and he had an idea for a series called What If? And what a, one of the what ifs was, what if Superman landed when he was sent down from Krypton, if he landed in Nazi Germany? Then Hitler would have had Superman on his side, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that was Jim Downey's brilliance. But the fact of the matter is, we, it, there was so many things going on in the world, and we were so politically conscious of it, that it would have been unnatural for us not to do it. Do you think that political satire is especially entertaining? Oh, I mean, God. I understand no. that you felt an almost a mandate that we should cover this material. But do you also think that when you look back on your career, that you could say, you know, actually, some of the political satire that I wrote is actually not, you know, is, is, is funny and smart and particularly entertaining, which is a separate point of, you know, it's like, the, is it one of the funniest stuff we ever did was really the political stuff. I'm wondering whether, because the, the, the great dictator is all over the pageantry of these two fascists. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, I was- Shane, to a great extent, you know, political satire, whether you go back to Jonathan Swift, okay, you, you, all through the years, through um, books, cinema, whatever, it's the little guy punching up, okay? You're punching up at the president. You look at Monty Python, what they've done with the queen, okay? Yeah, yeah. It's punching up. It's people who, within our society, within this system that we've created, this hierarchy, it's a guy who's a step or two or three below getting his um, his licks in. Okay, so I think it's necessary. I think that it's um, 
it, it's got to be recognized. So I think it's vital, quite frankly. Do you, do you think that political satire can change hearts and minds? And um, I'll, ask, you, I'll tell you why I'll ask you this, because <laughs> I give you some time to think about your answer. Because the, the, uh, the uh, Great Dictator was very successful, five Academy Award nominations. And yet when America got in the war, no one talked about rescuing Jews. Here we were, we, we, we saw this movie a year before Pearl Harbor, two years before Auschwitz. We saw what was happening to Jews on the street, right? Humiliated, persecuted, thugs, thugs beating them up. No one, not Roosevelt, no one discussed this idea of rescuing Jews. And I'm wondering, well, maybe this, this is an interesting point that it, it has an effect, but a limited effect. It certainly did not galvanize the nation. Well, that's a fascinating question. I think that there's a degree of subjectivity in terms of how something is received, perceived, and whether it uh, instigates any kind of activism. Uh, for Chaplin to do a uh, gas chambers two years before they actually happen, well, I think that that's where a confluence of the artist and also the, you know, his politics. He looked into the future. What's the worst case scenario? I don't know what his process was, but it would seem to me that if it's going to an extreme, he, when, it, when, he, when it was discovered that there was a Buchenwald, a Bobby R or any of those places, didn't Chaplin say, I would not have done it had it been going on at the time I did this movie? Right, but then why didn't someone, including Chaplin, say, hey, I called it. Right, he's going, hey, look at me. I, I was way ahead of the pitch. Look at me, I'm a genius. I told you guys two years ago to watch out. Let's go rescue people because I understand in the back pages of the New York Times, everyone, no one discussed the Holocaust. It was literally in the back pages. There's a book by a friend of mine, Laurel Left, that the title is called Buried in the Times. That's the name of the book. And it's about how the New York Times never covered the Holocaust while it was having, it was page 26, 27, small little pieces. No one said, hey, the great dictator, let's go do this, right? Let's go rescue that. I find this so fascinating. Well, you know something? I wonder if back then there was a distinction between what was entertainment and what was reality and what was um, politically uh, whatever. I, I, I do think that there were, by and large, Entertainment back then was escapism. I you see. had mentioned Fred Astaire and musicals. And so you're saying you don't think the aspiration in those days was that a film, you know, would like, you know, start a movement, right? I, well, I, I do think that in those days it would not, but I do think that we have evolved as a culture where it can motivate and it can change minds. There's a bombardment of things with 24 seven cable news networks, everything that we're exposed to, you can't get away from it. So it's there, right? Whereas before is okay, five Academy Awards and all of that, it was still a movie and I go to the movie to laugh. Okay, so if I went to go see the, the great dictator, I would still see Chaplin in his first talkie, right? His dialect was reminiscent of uh, Sid Caesar. Yeah, he was still flying the, upside the gibberish. down. The yeah. gibberish, gibberish, right? He was yeah. um, even the little dance he did after he got hit with the pan, the frying yeah. pan. It was yeah. Chaplin doing it. So there was an entertainment thing there. We're watching Charlie Chaplin. We're watching yeah. whether he was playing the little tramp, you know, the tramp or not, you know, as the barber. And I know you said that that's a debatable um, issue. Yeah, there is there is a debate about whether. The Jewish barber is the tramp that Chaplin, Chaplin didn't uh, uh, disavowed that. He said they're two separate characters. But there was a debate that the tramp was really just another manifestation, an iteration of, of the Jewish barber. You know, something just being a viewer of it, you know, I would think so. But, you know, um, you know, once again, there were points made. Now, listen, with the benefit of hindsight, one of my favorite scenes in The uh, Great Dictator is when um, Hitler dances with 
the balloon. The That's the globe. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that. Great. It's well, it's Chaplin at his most poetic best. Okay, there was some. There was it was a ballet. Yeah. And you can, you looked at his eyes and you looked at the way he looked at the world yeah. that he was going to conquer. So there was a relationship there. And then what happens? It busts at the end. Yes. As if it's a foreboding. Now, I might be reading into it, but I sat back and I marveled at it. It, it was something that was, yes, nonverbal, just like, you know, climbing the drapes. Shaving that guy with, uh, to uh, yeah. what was it, Romanian Rhapsody number five. Yeah. So, by I, the way, Alan, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it's important to point out that the ballet was yeah. to Wagner. And that is very powerful image because everyone knew that the theme music for the Nazis was Wagner. So yeah. think, about, think about that, 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 that Chaplin and the, that pivotal scene that you're describing used Wagner, not his own score, he no. went to Wagner. You know, the, you know, and I remember years later, Woody Allen even said, uh, someone said Wagner. He says, you know, the Wagner. Wagner. <laughs> the Nazis said Wagner. Yeah. Wagner. So, so let, let's talk about the Globe scene as a, as a political satirist who's written so much comedic sure. material. There's something that I found interesting because I thought that people like you say, I use comedy to do off-speed stuff, offset the serious there's a little serious thing that I let a little air out of the balloon, so to speak. I give you a little comedy as an offsetting thing to lighten the mood, change the mood. Then I bring you back to the serious thing. But what I think, I think about this movie is that they're both at the same time operating, right? That, that a scene can be both hilarious and brilliant in the same way. I love the way you've described the loving, the way he lovingly looked at the globe while he was punching it with his butt cheeks, Yes. right? It, 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 I do think that its effect, once again, is if the Chaplin stuff, or in general, if the jokes, if the impersonations, if the, uh, the hyperbole is embedded in a bigger, on a bigger canvas where a point is trying to be made, well, then I think you, you, you're doing a service. You know, sometimes people, while they're laughing, for them to laugh, they have to watch or listen to what they, what's, what's right, being right, presented right, right. to them. And the hope would be is that something gets in. I, I maintain that back then, um, as startling as it is, and it's only when you do the timeline that somebody from today will go, my God. Yeah. Back then, I do think that there was a distinction, and maybe it was a different landscape, it was a different palette that he was operating within, I don't think that it was um, big enough to cause a movement. I wow. Think. Hmm. So um, quickly, fascists, you think they're funnier? Is there something <laughs> funny, exactly funny about guys in uniform, you know, guys trumpeting themselves, giving, you know, I love the way Napoloni has, Lini has that mugging Mussolini grin, you know, he made Mussolini lovable, Jack Oakey did. <laughs> and if I closed my eyes, he sounded a little bit like Chico Marx. Exactly. Yeah, so I'm going, well, wait a second. So Mussolini all of a sudden becomes adorable. There's <laughs> something lovable about Mussolini. Do, yes. I, do I think fascists are funny? I think that they are rife to be made fun of and have fun with. Once again, it's punching up. It's people who take themselves so incredibly seriously you know one of the great sketches on your show of shows was uh, called the dressing of the general okay so Sid Caesar was there and Howie Morris was helping him get his uniform on with the epaulets with the hat okay and then ultimately he gave him a, a whistle and he realized that he was a, a doorman trying to flag down a cab <laughs> right? but until that moment That's it great. was hysterically funny because here he was and you know, Sid Caesar played it as if he's the stentorian guy, and he's and he's one of them. You know, um, so I do think. Look, once again, I harken back to Python. You go back to the movies that, um, you know, Stripes by Bill Murray. You, you're talking about military. You're talking about where a sense of order and a yeah. sense of precision. Well, that's right for making fun of. I see. Good. I think that's. 
Um, I don't want to get into, I don't want to get stuck in this, but I feel like I have to at least ask you, but I don't get stuck, which is Donald Trump. All right. Uh, Obviously, Alec Baldwin, you know, portrayed him on SNL for the entire full years. Many people referred to him in a kind of, you know, Mussolini like strong man that he loved strong men like him, Putin. Uh, He seemed rife for comedy. There were people who made associations that the 30s in Germany was like it was during the Trump administration. I'm just curious, do you think, you know, even the, uh, the fake news, Hitler had a term for this, Alan, called Lungenpresse, which was called lying press. So, wow, that's an amazing parallel. Hitler said Lungenpresse and, and Trump said fake news, right? I'm wondering, do you think that those comparisons are appropriate? Given the yes. gravity, given the gravity of what even Chaplin said, you know, do you think that as a Jew from Long Island that you can't possibly make that association? You can see why people did it, but in some ways you, that, that, that would have its own way been transgressive. Yeah, I got to tell you something, Thane. Um, the phrase, make America great again, how is that different in tone and an underlying message than any master race speech, okay? Yeah. There, you know, when Hitler came around, yeah, there was a depressed country because they got the, you know, they, they lost everything World War I and he made them rise again and this is what they needed to hear. There was an, a, there was an appeal by uh, Mr. Trump to a certain segment and a large segment of the country, as we know, that needed to hear that. And it gave them power, it gave them hope within that framework, okay? I do think that there is a comparison because there's many, many times where you saw his um, power of persuasion over a crowd, mind you, his crowd, but Hitler had his crowd too, where uh, you're going, wow, they're buying it. My God, they believe it. Shit, this is scary. I don't want to get stuck in this either, but I feel like I've got Alan Zweibel. I can't miss the opportunity. It's too rich. Oh, by the way, hey, Alan, you know, we did years ago Duck Soup with Dick Cavett, uh, which I thought you should know because I would think you would think that was a cool night. Oh, it's real because he was great friends with Groucho. I know, I know. It was really, yeah, it was great. Um, the, The cancel culture that we live in today all right, I, I just want to hear what you think about it. Uh, comedians don't want to appear on college campuses. Um, you've made a career in many different ways in satire, humor. Uh, you know, I'm wondering, like, for instance, the, the Danish and the French cartoons parroting the Prophet Muhammad. People lost their lives over this. We're living in a very different world, right? cartoonists were killed for doing uh, pictures, cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, And yet at the same time, one of the biggest shows uh, in Broadway that's been on for years is the Book of Mormon. And you don't see examples of Mormons, you know, blowing stuff up or saying, there's actually a funny anecdote on opening night of the Book of Mormon. There was a, in the playbill, there was a full page ad that said, You've seen the musical, now come into the church and see the real thing. <laughs> right? as, if, as if to say, we can take it. We can take the joke. Right now I'm wondering, for a guy like you who's made a, a career, you just wrote this great memoir, Laugh Lines, My Life Helping Funny People Be Funnier. It's, does it seem to you that a portion of what you could make funny is no longer permitted? Thane, let's put it this way. For somebody who started writing jokes for Catskill Comics <laughs> and SNL, Shandling, um, Curb Your Enthusiasm, a lot of the things I've been fortunate enough to be a part of, if the cancel culture had their way, or if my career started today, that book would be a brochure, <laughs> okay? <laughs> <laughs> my whole career. Do you think you can get away with Roseanne, Rosanna Dana today? Do you think you can get along uh, 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 the, the samurai? I, I mean, it was not things. considered Rosanna. My God, you're right. No way. There's not a chance in hell. I the think samurai. Lauren did, Lauren did a. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Ready? The hamburger guy. 
Yeah, cheeseburger, cheeseburger, okay? Cheeseburger, right. How could the Greek diner? You know, there was a time where we all made fun of each other, and then we went to lunch, okay? <laughs> now we're skating on such thin ice. And what I find offensive about the cancel culture, and I, I, it, it's, I think that there's something so wrong with this political correctness because the paradox is that it makes people more divisive, okay? If we're laughing at each other with each other, there's a union there. There's a smile, there's a wink and hey, let's go bowling, okay? Now it's like, you can't, you, you, you can't. And what I, what I also res resent is whether it's Uncle Tom's Cabin, My Fair Lady, Anything that was written, you know, you look at um, To Kill a Mockingbird, you think the things that were written. Huck, Huck Finn. Hey, Huck Alan. Finn. Huck at Finn. a certain time in history, when this was the world, this was the way people spoke, this was their prejudices. You can't throw that out. If, any, if you want to put a positive spin on it, say, look how far we've come. OK, that's a good way to put it. You can look at it like that. But not everything is up for reconsideration. You know, um, well, Merchant of Venice. Yeah. I, I, will Shylock one day, you know, be played by Eddie Murphy? I, I, <laughs> I know what I'm saying. I don't know. How far does this go? Yeah. yeah. So I just think that everybody should basically take one big laxative. OK. <laughs> and just calm down. Well, you, one thing that I, you've now convinced me, you grew up in the right time frame, right? I mean, you, you, you've had an amazing career, but you've been lucky now that I think about it, right? You, you, showed, up the time, <laughs> right, you, you showed up at a time where instead of going to work for the Carol Burnett show, right? Right. You went to work for SNL and how, look how much better it was able to deploy you, right? To, to exploit Alan's Weibel skills, in a way that, you know, you might have been headed in that other direction and it wouldn't have been as fulfilling. It could have been. And, and, and back then, the Carol Burnett show was the gold standard. Yes. That came along. A new page was turned. It, the timing and the luck. Um, boy, oh boy, uh, I'm humbled by it. Because yeah, it, it, it makes was, sense. It was, it was very, very fortunate. Yes. Let me ask you another question about the comedy uh, verge piece of the, uh, the Great Dictator, and then soon we'll ask some questions from the audience. This has been so much fun, Alan. We could do this for two more hours. Oh, you, you never... We should be friends. This... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so the AFI, the American Film Institute, does their lists of the greatest films of all time. So for instance, you know, often when they do the list, Citizen Kane, The Godfather, you know, one, two for, sure. for when it comes to, when it comes to um, the greatest screenplay of all time, it usually goes to the Epstein brothers and Casablanca as number one. Uh, when it comes to the big best movie heroes and villains, ready for this? Oscar Schindler's 13, James Bond is three, uh, Indiana Jones is two, and, and, and uh, Atticus Finch is one. Not Batman, not Superman, Atticus Finch, interesting thing. When it comes to the comedic films, ready, ready for this? 37, 37 is The Great Dictator. 36 is Animal House, which was probably written by guys that you <laughs> employed because you, you hired a lot of those Lampoon guys. You just mentioned the Harvard guy. You probably hired half the people yeah. who wrote that movie. Well, let me just say, hired, number, three, just number three is Dr. Strangelove. Number two is Tootsie. And number one is some like it hot. I got to tell you, I just saw the great dictator. I was, aff I'm offended by that list. How is it number 37, one behind Animal House? Why do you think that this film, why do you think the film it, it has not been regarded in the way among, among people that care about comedic films in the way that I think it deserves? I, I think that some of the movies that you mentioned that are above it on the list, I love Tootsie and to Tootsie does make a point. And um, I know that the process, Larry Gelbart, Murray Shiskel and all those guys, I know the, how long they labored over making the point that they did that a man had to become a woman to see how 
to appreciate how a woman thinks and lives. So that's subliminal, but that was the point of it. Look, for I, I can't explain how this is 38 and Animal House is 37. I, I, I can't, <laughs> but I can't. But I can tell you that I don't know if that list would be the same order five years from now. And I don't know if it was the same order 10 years ago. I think a lot, you know, anytime you have a list of any kind, they're so arbitrary and they're so subjective. You know, you, you look at the a list of the greatest baseball players. You know, yeah, you'll have Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle, but number six and number uh, 14 are pretty interchangeable. So I right. don't know. The, I, but to your point, I don't know in 2021 if the context and, and, and how brave it was uh, could possibly be appreciated um, by people who didn't live in that era, didn't understand what the context was. You know, you mentioned the 36 Olympics, okay, with Jesse yeah. Owens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only person sent home though was Marty Glickman, a Jew. Oh like no, there was two, weren't there two? Oh, there were two. That's they're on the relay, right? Yeah, in the relay, in the yeah, in the four four by four, right? There were two one was Sam something. I forgot Sam his last something name. Something and Marty Glickman. Okay. So you look at what the world was like, and then you get uh Animal House. Every time I watch it, I see you know it's on, I watch it, I show it to my kids. Now my grandkids love it. It's um antics. It's funny. It's 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 uh, in its own way. Uh, it's um, you're punching up because you're within the framework of a university. Okay, if I want to take that same analogy and, and put it under a, a bigger net, um, so th there is an element that of there which is not dissimilar. I can't tell you why one is above the other, but I, I do think that those things are meant to change. Um, talk a little before we take some questions from the audience. Uh, t tell us a little about the book, the memoir. The, the memoir is, I, I call it a cultural memoir because like I said, it's almost 50 years, God, am I old. Starting with me writing jokes that I sold for $7 a joke to Catskill comedians, then SNL, and I take us through its Gary Shandling show, which was the beginning of cable comedy. And um, I also do some of the things that... Um, uh, that I that that would bombs. Okay, there's an honesty so I <laughs> all the way through. Curb your enthusiasm and a movie I just wrote with Billy Crystal that stars him and Tiffany Haddish. We're waiting for a release date. It's called Here Today. Yeah, um, it's um, I wrote it because I didn't want to have something that just said, and now I wrote this and now I wrote that. <clears throat> I wanted it to have some heart. And when my friend Gilda Radner died, I wrote a book called Bunny Bunny, which was about she and I. And that was an outpouring of my love for her. And it was a boy and a girl who had a platonic love affair for 14 years. Um, when Shandling died, I didn't have that opportunity. He was like a brother to me. We were then estranged. Um, and he, Gilda's, Gilda's death took a wider turn. It was cancer. Gary all of a sudden was dead, okay? I needed to have an outpouring of some sort to talk to him and give him a tribute of some sort. So once I realized that I can complete the circle of we were coming back to being friends, if I tapped into that, I go, all right, I can give this a little bit more heart. So that's why I wrote it. And like I said, it's a fun ride. It's very nostalgic. It gets you behind the scenes. But like I said, they're not all home runs. There's a a movie that I wrote that Roger Ebert in his review used the word hate in it 14 <laughs> times, okay? So there was a couple of foul tips yeah. along the way too. So uh, before we take some questions from the audience, I'm just curious, we, we talked to this a little bit off camera, but the, 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 the chaplain's final speech, the monologue, right? Truly extraordinary. That's not the sort of thing you see in a movie. The quality of the writing was extraordinary. It's political implications extraordinary. Like he was clearly selling something to the world. He was speaking truthfully about what he fears. One of the things I'm interested about that speech is he doesn't really use the word evil men. He spends a lot of time talking about machines. 
right? Like the machine, you're not a machine, you're being controlled by machines. And I, I always found that really fascinating. You know, he wasn't even referring to evil human beings. He was referring to sort of the mechanized culture, the desensitizing culture, like Big Bertha, the opening scene with that gigantic yes. weapon, right? And, and, and it doesn't work, right? The big, the, the giant weapon oh. doesn't even work, right? And, it, and, and he uses the physical comedy of the thing just landing like that. But it, there is a stronger message that, you know, look, we're living right now in an age of, you know, misinformation, disinformation, the, the, a much more mechanized. We've got drones, you know, uh, electric cars are going to drive for us, you know, things that he was anticipating about how there's a disconnect between machines and humanity. And I wonder if you want to maybe talk about that, because you're seeing this a lot now with social media and the Internet and the pandemic. We don't even see each other anymore. I haven't seen your face. This is a, a treat for me. You know, I, get to, <laughs> I get to see you. And I'm just saying we are now so dependent on the very thing that in the movie he describes as inimical to humanity. It's um, so socialization or what we always had considered to be socialization, um, it's scary how detached we are. I mean, I've got five grandchildren who go to school virtually. Yeah. And, and two of those kids are of middle school age when it should be boys and girls and this and parties and this and that. Okay, that's pandemic. Um, but at the same time, you're absolutely right. There is eye contact is a thing of the past. All right, attention spans are this big. And, but what I found fascinating about that last speech, and I, th and I agree with you totally, um, it was about machines, it wasn't about evil, even, he doesn't talk about bad people. Yes. I wrote this down, he, he said, the hate of man will pass and dictators die and the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. So it's almost like love, hate, liberty is a thing, okay? It's, it's those things that um, are imposed upon man as opposed to the men being the purveyors of those things. Um, I think that once again, it's him uh, you know, look, every, we all know that every generation or every revolution, let's go back to the Industrial Revolution. That, what, that, now, with computer age, we, there's a period of adjustment. How are we going to survive? People are going to be fall by the wayside, okay? There aren't that many toll takers anymore because we all have easy passes, all right? So yeah, things yeah. change. Um, so that we all live within a mechanism that we've created for our convenience by and large. And um, we become victims to our own power, what we have created. And I think that that's what he meant. That last speech, boy, oh boy, what a, um, what a ballsy thing to do. <laughs> I, I don't know any other way to put it, Thane. Yeah. At yeah. the end, of, it, it was in context, but it was preaching. It yeah. Was, it was him looking straight at you, the audience, and talking about life and hope and 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 and, and all of those things. And it's was there. I'm asking you now. That last speech was there a big hoopla about it, either at the studio yeah. end or yeah, yeah. It was it, it, it. You know, everyone in the business, right, in the the, the Zwei Bells of the age, said this is not what you do in a movie. Yeah. You know, this is too avowedly political. It's too explicit, right? You're giving a five minute oration at the end. <laughs> you know, it's not even a dialogue, it's a monologue. You know, it's this is, you know, so they said, you know, the question there is after all of that comedy, the physical comedy, the witty things, the, you know, the, the, the gibberish German, he lands on something that is as serious as we've ever seen in a movie. Right, something, yeah. and there's no jokes after that at all. It's done, right? There's no return. This is like all you need to know is in that speech. 
So I think for many people, Alan, it was very uh, disjointed, right? Like where did where the hell did that come from? <laughs> yes, right. I, uh, yeah, I applauded it. I, I and, and but I put myself in the position of people back then, or somebody who said, "Oh, let's watch a movie," and all of a sudden this guy he gets up on the soapbox and talks for five minutes about this stuff. What I do think is once again. The, the politics of Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. Uh, I think he probably felt I've got a platform now. It's within context of everything that I just did for the last hour and a half. I've got a point to make and I've got a guy who's making a speech. <clears throat> I wonder, I wonder today, um, you know, there's, that debate still rages today in general about comedians politicizing, Polit yeah. okay, um, how far can you go? Do, do they have a right to, Do we are we gonna take it seriously? And that debate is probably very similar, you know, because the debate is always, I have an opportunity to be heard. This is what I wanna say. Yeah, Let me, let's take one question from the audience, then we'll do some closing remarks and say goodbye to Alan. Uh, this sort of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, but she's asking a very specific question. This comes from Miss Jean Golden, who says, I agree that it is important to limit the display of atrocities via film and other art forms. Yet, to this day, there continues to be deniers of the Nazi atrocities, as well as other atrocities. What is the best way to use art to get through to the deniers? It's a tough question, Alan. Right. I mean, are we are we using art right now to do it? Are we doing it well? I mean, I would suggest that all the Holocaust films, there's been so many since The Great Dictator. Right. I mean, an endless stream, certainly in the 1990s, was sort of the heyday of Holocaust art. And at the same time, in that decade, we had Rwanda and Bosnia and the Congo. How is it possible that we would open up a museum on the D.C. Mall dedicated to the Holocaust. And then Schindler's List would crush it and the Oscars, right? right? And at the same time, you have Rwanda and Bosnia and the Congo going on at the same. How is that possible? Well, my guess is that our population, there are probably more people who were affected by the Holocaust than... Um, the Hanoi Hilton or any, any, anything else that we want to point to. Yeah. I think that uh, these, um, it, 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 sometimes it's generational, who, who relates to it, who can personalize about it. And uh, just like the woman who just asked this question, I think, I think just by having this discussion, just by people doing it, we can, we can judge film, books, opera, Broadway, whatever, TV, whatever, based on its entertainment merits, okay? But I think the intent, once again, that these are becoming subjects and we are playing on that field, I think that in and of itself speaks volumes and it's right. a good Good. Gives us another reason to be in business with folks. So thank you. <laughs> you, bet. you know, any anything that produces ideas is a good thing, given what you just said. Right. I, I, I think so. I think that, look, we have to make a point. We have to get it across. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad uh, or, or, or not properly executed. But the fact that we do do it, that we do play on that field and we OK, um, or use that as uh, a setting or a palette, I think that there's a lot of merit and I think there's a lot of good that comes out of it, even if it's subliminal. Good, all right, a fabulous way to end, Alan, thanks. Let's just do uh, one, let's see, we have some closing remarks. What's, we have an upcoming event, right? Shervin, what do we got? Oh yeah, we have, uh, this is gonna be great. February 24th, I guess that's next week, uh, the Folks Film Series continues. This is a new film by IFC. Uh, it's a documentary on Martin Luther King and the FBI. 
uh, a, a subject that people have always hinted at, that the FBI had been uh, uh, eavesdropping on Martin Luther King. And so this is uh, uh, an Academy Award nominated director. I think this film has already received a number of nominations by Sam Pollard is the director of this film. Uh, and we also have Annette Gordon-Reed who will be with us that night. She's the one that wrote the book, The Hemingses of, of, of Monticello, uh, the relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, which won the National Book Award. So she'll be with us for that as well. We have anything else? We have a lot of things. Stay tuned. There's more events coming up. But for now, that's the one that's the most up to date. Yes, we are a nonprofit. Uh, we have in charge during the pandemic. It'd be great to have you participate. You can text it in or you can just go to folks.org forward slash donate. And there's the text number there. You all have that. Alan, you're such a good friend and you're such a treasure, really. You're just an, an American treasure. Thank and you so much. What, what makes me so happy, right? I want the people to know, look, go to the chat box, go read Laugh Lines. You've now, if you haven't known Alan, you now, he, he came to your home. <laughs> he visited your home. Homes, yes. <laughs> he visited your home. You know, now the, you know, buy the book, read the book. It's going to be enormously entertaining and enlightening. And Alan, it makes me so happy to know that, you know, not only are you youthful at 70, but you're working, you know, that there's that you, we're going to have more Zweibel art that your grandchildren will point to. And that's an amazing gift. So thank you for that, Alan. All thank right. You. Thank you. It was great fun. I thank you so much for asking me not only to do this, but it was your idea to do the great dictator. And, um, Boy, oh boy, you hit a home run with that choice. So thank you. Well, it was, it, it, you made it a home run. So thank you so much, Alan. I'm Thane Rosenbaum. Until next time for folks. Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>